Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are grappling with the thorny subject of buying your shares based on valuation. The great Warren Buffett has developed an incredibly powerful model for this, which is suggesting one thing, but our market's doing something else. Look at the numbers, look at the results, and you'll see for yourself. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentio. Thanks for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter. Different background every time we chat here via Zoom. It's good to see I'm almost getting a full tour of your office. <laughs> yeah, the delights of uh, lockdown. Got a bit of a lockdown haircut going on at the moment too. So looking forward to getting that snip fairly short. Oh, good stuff, buddy. And no doubt looking at that bookshelf behind you, you've got probably got some material on Warren Buffett, which is the topic <laughs> of conversation today. I'll try not to get tongue tied. Is the Warren Buffett way right? We're going to talk stock valuation, PE ratios, tech stocks, traditional stocks. There's plenty in this broadcast. Absolutely. And look, the great sage of Omaha, there's no question, the world's most famous investor, arguably one of the world's most successful investors. And I think an absolute fool would start off by challenging him saying, is he right when he's renowned for the, <laughs> the billions he's made for his investors? Uh, but you know, if you look at the more recent performance, uh, and I'm not talking over the last five minutes, but over the last 10, 15 years, you know, Berkshire Hathaway's performance has started to drift away uh, and underperform the broader market. And I'm sure you've got some stats on that whether that's due to the virtue of the size of Berkshire Hathaway or whether it's got something uh, to do with the way uh, the investment methodology is conducted, I guess it's something that we can explore uh, in our time together today. And before we run through that, AB, we, look, we've got a lot of younger listeners who tune into our broadcast. For anyone, God forbid, who doesn't know who Warren Buffett is or what Berkshire Hathaway is for that matter, can you just give us a, a little brief rundown on that? Okay, so uh, yeah, I think you'd need to be living under a rock uh, if you've looked at investing and don't know who, uh, who Warren Buffett is. So Warren Buffett founded uh, a company called Berkshire Hathaway, I think back in the late 50s from memory. And um, it's the sort of investor that comes in and when he buys a position, isn't uh, buying you know, a couple of hundred shares. He's usually buying 5, 10, 15% of a company along with board seats and then starting to turn that business around. And I mean, his business interests are very widespread. Um, you know, if you think about things that you've got in your home, uh, Warren Buffett through Berkshire Hathaway, of course, own uh, around about 5% of Apple. That's just incredible when you think about it. It's the single biggest investment Berkshire Hathaway is involved with. I think it's over, oh, gee, it'd be well over 15, 20% of their funds under management, uh, specifically um, in, in Apple as a business. It's kind of interesting when you've got such a large position in an organization that talks about the benefits of diversification, that's for sure. Uh, some other products that you might have in your house, um, Nakona cowboy boots, which I happen to have a pair of, also owned by Berkshire Hathaway. So yeah, an enormous spread um, of uh, different types of businesses in that portfolio. Um, but right now, uh, underperforming, and part of the reason I think it's underperforming, as we'll explore, is that lack of exposure to tech. Totally. And Berkshire Hathaway, for anyone who doesn't know, is a fund that you can buy and sell on the market as well, which is great. Yeah, if you... There's a you know, hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars a share. <laughs> yeah. Let me just reach out of my back pocket. I've got that right here, AB. But uh, look, big. I guess the big component of this was, was the book that Warren Buffett wrote that was called The Warren Buffett Way, which talked particularly about valuation. And more recently, Warren's been able to come up with some different kinds of valuation methods, particularly those pertaining to GDP. For those out there, how do we value stocks just broadly? And how is Warren Buffett doing this differently to what most would? Look, the traditional way, if you're using ratios, uh, the one that you'd, a lot of people would see out there is something, of course, called the price earnings ratio, which is the price of the shares divided by their earnings. I guess, yeah, the price is unambiguous. It's where the shares are trading at at a given point in time. The earnings, I guess, is where things start to get a little bit more challenging insofar as do you use last year's earnings, which are factual, uh, in which case you're buying a share today for what it's done in the past and we all know we buy shares for what they're likely to do in the future or do you use uh, an estimate a guess a forecast of what the earnings are expected to be next year which can be you know incredibly difficult so half of that ratio is based on uh, a guess or it's based on history neither of which are particularly useful but nonetheless it does give uh, a benchmark to help people decide um, when a company is better value to buy or whether it's overvalued and looking fairly expensive because 
price and value are two very, very different things. You know, you, price is what you pay. Value is not always what you get. So having a valuation tool is key. If we're talking about property, of course, we talk about the uh, price of the property uh, divided by the rental income to give you that um, uh, amount of uh, ratio. So you could discern whether, of course, that property was overvalued or whether it was cheap. We do exactly the same thing with shares. Now, one of the really interesting tools, and this is a brilliant piece of uh, financial engineering and development, is looking at the ratio uh, of the, uh, the share market and its valuation level versus GDP. And this is something that Warren Buffett has exposed for an awful long time, and it is an absolutely fantastic measure of really stepping back and, and looking at where the common sense, I suppose, uh, should sit. And, and what they've done there, they take the market capitalization of the top stocks, let's say the Worship 5000 in, in, in the US or the S&P 500, whichever index you want to use, but probably the Worship 5000 would be the best one to use. And they tot up the market capitalization, which is what all the shares on issue multiplied by what those shares are priced at. So if you've got 100 shares on issue and your share price is $10, your market capitalization is $1,000. Do that for the entire market and you come up with a figure for what the stock market is worth in the trillions of dollars as of today. Now that gives you one level of that um, uh, equation. The second thing, you divide it by the value of the GDP of the country to give you a percentage figure to show whether the stock market, relatively speaking, is expensive compared to what's actually going on within the economy itself. It's a fantastic, brilliant, brilliant measure. And uh, full kudos, of course, to its author. It's why it's one of the most successful investors in the world. Let's take a look at some of Warren's, Warren's results over the long term. If we take since, say, 1965, Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway as such, has been able to outperform the S&P 500 by a range on average between 18 to 10% per annum. Not so much recently, though. The last 15 years, they've actually outperformed. And as you mentioned at the start of the broadcast, probably due to their lack of exposure to tech so, stocks. So, yeah, Berkshire have underperformed for the last 15 years. That's that's the case and over the last 10 years and after the last five years. So in all of those short-term discrete periods, Berkshire Hathaway has underperformed uh, the, the index by really quite some margin. Uh, and as you mentioned, that's partly... Uh, due to Berkshire not being heavily exposed to technology, yet we're in an economy and we're particularly in a market where the big growth stories, the big surge in value in markets has come through those giga cap companies, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Google, uh, to give you a couple of those, uh, which are obviously, of course, all in the technology sector. And if you're not exposed to the hottest race in town, then you are going to, to underperform on a relative basis. And that's certainly been the case for, for Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, and if we look at the US market as it stands, using, using that formula we talked of before, market cap divided by the GDP of the country, the US equity market is trading at 243%. Now, based on history, if you look back at how the equity market is correlated to the overall um, GDP of a country, the US equity market, based on that very, very powerful and time-tested tool, is about 95% overvalued, or 3.1 standard deviations if you're a statistician, above its statistical average. Whichever measure you choose to use, it's massively, massively overvalued. And under normal conditions, you'd be reaching for the hard hat and waiting for the market to correct or crash to come back down to some level of sensibility. Because GDP is not going to take off and explode through the roof. You've, to get that ratio back under control, the real logical uh, event that you can expect is, of course, a correction in markets. That's under normal conditions. But, you know, we live in a crazy world uh, in, in the current era. And part of the reason that market is so extended is because of the, the, the performance, if you will, of technology companies. And, and the way you evaluate a technology company is so different to how you would evaluate a traditional business, particularly using PEs. You know, if you look at the Commonwealth Bank, uh, based on a PE, you know, if it's between these levels, it's fairly valued. If it's down here, it's cheap. If it's up there, it's a time to buy. But when you start to see some of these technology valuations, which are almost infinitesimal in some instances, you think, well, it's just too overvalued. But you're not buying a company based on the current metrics of the world we live in. You're buying a company based on where it's going to be and the impact it's going to have globally, I suppose, in the coming years. And, and, and this is where it gets very, very hard to use a traditional mechanism to value something in the current climate. 
Totally. Let's look have, have a look at some specific examples on that, AB, in the tech sector. We have a look at Tesla reading my notes here. 392 uh, is the is the at times is the PE ratio. Afterpay, 171 times. Hang on, hang on. So let's talk about Tesla for a moment. This is a company a couple like you know, 18 months, two years ago, people saying, Oh, it's it's on the brink, it could be going. It's all it could be time for it to implode. It was that shooting star, and very clearly hasn't been the case. You know, due in part to the to the the, the staunch belief of its CEO and vision, uh, but also the world has shifted, and they were ahead of the curve. And this whole notion of uh, of, you know, of electric cars, every manufacturer now is coming out uh, with a, with an electric car. I'm, I haven't made that move. I'm, I'm I'm a committed petrol driver at the moment, very heavily committed. V12, V12, six liter twin turbo, mate. That's about as bad as you can have on that on that spectrum. Um, in, in in that regard. Uh, but the world is definitely moving. So maybe I need to get my backside into gear. I did have a look at the SF90 Ferrari a little while ago. I got the track down that. That is a hybrid. It's not petrol, but it's not electric. It's a hybrid. But uh, that's- well, a quality problem to have. And <laughs> in the example of Tesla, people buy Tesla for what Tesla's going to do in the future, not what it's done in the past. Afterpay is the same. Well, Tesla Amazon- sells a small number of, sorry, Mitch, you know, Tesla sells a very, very small number of cars relative to Toyota or General Motors. But its market capitalization, it, it, the size of its business it is multiples of those companies because it's seen as being the car industry in the future, which I, I, whether that's placed or misplaced, I don't know. You, know, you, you started to mention Afterpay and I cut you off. I do beg your pardon. What were we saying, sorry? So, you know, it wasn't so long ago that you and I were looking at Afterpay and it was at 40 bucks and we're saying that was overvalued. Now it's, you know, 100 plus easily today. It's 130 bucks, something like that. Um, how long can that steam train keep running for? Warren Buffett wouldn't touch it with a, with a stick. Uh, but if you're a new retail investor and you want some fast growth, tech stocks are the way to go, right? Well, after pay, I, I remember that conversation around our boardroom vividly, you know, 40 bucks ago, and this is crazily overvalued. There's no earnings. But very clearly, these guys saw what was coming down the line for, you know, and must have had a far better set of lenses than certainly me and a lot of investors at the time. Now it's been taken over, of course, by Jack Dorsey and Square, $100, $130 a share. Uh, just goes to show that you know people that have the lenses to see into the future is what's going to be there wouldn't bat an eyelid at paying 130 bucks for a stock that we thought was cooked at 40. Uh, and it's not just after pay either, Mitch. I mean, you know, if you look at stocks like Amazon, it's 61 times earnings, which is probably almost three times more from a PE point of view than you'd be comfortable paying for a lot of stocks. Uh, yet Amazon is on that growth trajectory, you know, in spite of you know, Jeff Bezos' retirement, the business is set up with such a robust internal self-fulfilling prophecy of a corporate plan that just plonked growth on top of growth, on top of growth, on top of growth, year in, year out. Can't recommend it highly enough. One of the books behind me, The Bezos Letters. If you're an entrepreneur or an investor, you want to know why Amazon's done so well, read that book. It's called The Bezos Letters. And it's an insight of what he writes to the shareholders each year as he's done since they've been listed incredible so you know it's at 61 times earnings it's insane netflix 62 times earnings why well as we've all seen through this period of lockdown you know that's where people are going to to get their information now or, or rather to get their entertainment streaming on demand you know the likes of foxtel for example which you know 15 years ago was at the vanguard oh, i've got foxtel you don't have to rest you've got foxtel now plagued with adverts and fairly limited syllabus you get something that's a fraction of the cost that's got content galore um that's why that stock is driven as hard as it has. And you've seen the subscriber numbers run up on the back of it. You know, you look at Disney, here's an interesting one because Disney is a very, very traditional business. 91 times PE, which is so far and beyond anything it's ever traded at. And again, from a value investor basis, you wouldn't touch Disney with a barge pole at 91 times earnings. So why is it so high? Two reasons. One, its earnings dropped away um, because of obviously COVID and people not going to theme parks and the disruption to movie production which is another big chunk of what it does you know you gotta remember disney owns uh 21st century fox mirror makes um uh lucas films all of these stables of movies over time um it, it's acquired and, and and built out and so movie production has been slowed down so why is its share price so high well because it's now a tech company really because it's moved into that streaming space to compete with stan or netflix with Disney Plus. And so valuation has shifted up to be more like a tech stock than the traditional Disney business 
uh, that we would have seen and traded many, many times, of course, over the last couple of decades. So, you know, that's why the valuation has moved as dramatically as it has there. Um, you know, within then the more traditional big gigatech um, sector in technology, you look at Facebook and Apple, they're both trading at around you know, 28 and 30 times earnings respectively, which is still reasonably expensive, but is far more palatable than something that's on 60 times earnings. Why? Because of their sheer size and scale and the normalization of their businesses now, their PEs have dropped back down to more regular types of levels, which make them, of course, um, something that a value investor would then consider. And I think this is partly why Berkshire have missed out on the tech sector, because they don't buy into stocks that are chronically overvalued. But are they overvalued or is there a different valuation matrix that you use to look at stocks that are really 100% exposed to the future? Got you. And we can compare that to some of Berkshire Hathaway's biggest holdings, Bank of America, uh, American Express and Moody's. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination are these high growth tech stocks. So a paradigm difference as to where the growth's coming from, where Berkshire Hathaway sits. Uh, AB, on that note, I mean, is Warren Buffett wrong? Here's the big question. <laughs> nah. <I> could... <laughs> Be careful what we say here, right? When, when, when we look down the line in three months' time or six months' time or 12 months' time, and some of these shooting stars come crashing back to earth, that would be a very different question to then ask, wouldn't it? Insofar as, okay, maybe their valuations were a little bit stretched and better to stick to the knitting and go off that long-term game plan. And you got to remember, whilst he's underperformed, he hasn't lost money. That's the key thing. There's a huge difference there. Um, yeah, there's one thing underperforming, there's another thing losing money. Now, I mean, we're in an environment, and if you look at some of those core holdings, particularly when you consider uh, the likes of American Express, which obviously is in the charge card business, the growth that is now being experienced, and we revert back to Afterpay, which I'm sure is why you know Square and Jack Dorsey decided to buy it. There's a whole demographic of people that are not interested in owning a credit card, and it doesn't matter what points you get, they're not interested in owning a credit card. And who can blame them when you're getting slugged with 15, 16, 17 percent interest? On, on, on the balance that might sit on that card. So that buy now, pay later space, which is a huge disruptor. Is a, a, and, and I guess if we don't get to it, remind me again to, to talk a little about this. There is a premium in disruptor technology. So if you've got an established industry like the credit card space, yeah, where you've got Visa, MasterCard and American Express, and I'd mentioned Diners Club, but that's one that you probably don't even know of yourself because it's it, that was the 1980s. It's still around, but yeah, that was way back then. It's a, a, a three-way split in that market, and they've had yeah, open field running for decades in that space with a very, very archaic model where there's effectively a monopoly or a triopoly, if you want to put it that way, uh, and they haven't had to worry about a lot of different things. It's, it's been the little closed shop for those guys. Then along comes a little Australian company that turns the world on its head. And it's not just Afterpay. I mean, Zip has also done the same thing. And there's, there's Sezzle and there's a whole variety of others in that buy now, pay later space. But what they've done is looked at a bloated and inefficient market and turned it on its head, captured enormous interest and in market share and captured a demographic which was never interested in looking at credit cards. You know, it doesn't matter how you repackage a credit card. That generation is simply not interested in it. And as such... Yeah, buy now, pay later. Is, uh, buy now, pay later has taken off, and someone that is invested in the model of American Express—that's the other side. That's the B side of the record that you're not interested in playing, and that's probably why that sector has been neglected. And and you go back a little bit further and look at disruptors in the uh, information or, or or entertainment space. Yeah, look at Netflix and Stan. I mean, Netflix has been around for actually a lot longer than what people would think. Um, you know, I think Netflix in its early incarnation, and I remember this, um, remember when Blockbuster Video, I'm sure some of our listeners remember, you go down and skip down to the shopping arcade at the weekend and get your DVDs to watch and take them back on Monday. Well, at that time, Netflix was around. Their whole business, though, was vending machines. They'd have them in airports and bus stations and places where there were a lot of foot traffic, shopping centers. You put your membership card in, out drop the DVD, no need to go to a Blockbuster shop, and that was... You know, you pay your fixed fee and you get as many DVDs as you want for the month. Just got to keep posting them back. That was how it started, but it moved and saw the future and migrated into streaming. It was a disruptor in that industry where Blockbuster was invincible, except for Blockbuster doesn't exist anymore. And Netflix is the predominant because it was a disruptor. You look at the taxi industry in Australia, CapCharge, all of those companies that had the ability to be at the vanguard as CapCharge was for a number of years. 
only to get absolutely kicked into touch when Uber comes in and totally disrupts that sector and industry. And there's a very, very different type of investor that looks for those pattern disruptors. And you can't buy them based on the valuation using traditional models because they're not traditional businesses. They're looking at a fat and overbloated industry and going, we can be more efficient, offer better service and be more price competitive. You can't use the measure for that B side the same as you would use it for the A side of the record. And so, you know, valuing them up is actually quite hard. And it comes down to whether you're on the same page, if you will, as the visionaries within those companies and you go cheeky and gel with them along that success path. And that's, that's a very, very different approach to valuation investing. Totally. Just different lenses to look at it, AB. And as we come to the end of this broadcast, we have a lot of brand new retail investors or soon to be retail investors coming into the market. How do you make that decision? Do you want to be traditional or do you want to be forward thinking? Because sometimes it can come back to bite you on the bum. Other times it can be the best thing since sliced bread. So how do you actually make that call? Look, that, that is a very, very good question. I, I don't know that you can finish a podcast on the back of that with that question because it opens so many doors for us to, to, to move into uh, further discussion. Markets are made up of a lot of different people. There are buy and holds, there are more active investors, there are traders. There are people that are looking for a smash and grab hit and run. There are angel investors in there. Uh, there are index investors in there and everything in between. So there's so many different methodologies in there. You know, for someone that's listening to this and, and let's say you're managing your own super or you've got a portfolio of shares, I think risk management isn't just about having a couple of different stocks in your portfolio in the traditional sense where you've got maybe two of the banks, a couple of the miners, a couple of grocers, you know, and financial services company on it. I think you know, diversification can also overlay in terms of investment style too, because what you then introduce by having different styles of investing, a nice core portfolio, maybe you're doing some covered calls, cash on demand, which is ever and butter on that core holding to get some cash flow out of it and fairly stable stocks, but then a smaller allocation towards more robust growth type businesses. And the reason for that is the pattern of their performance, as we've discussed with Berkshire Hathaway versus the broader market, that core portfolio is going to have a different performance profile to uh, something that's a little bit more aggressive uh, and speculative by its nature. And so you're getting diversification across market timing. If there's a tech sell-off, that'll drop, but this will hold up. If you've got a steady she goes market, this will grind along, but this will explode. So you're getting a little bit of exposure to both. And that makes sense to me in a lot of different ways. I guess the hardest thing is working out how early on do you plant the flag and say, yeah, no one taking an interest in this broadcast is likely to be an angel investor in the venture capital space. We did do some of that, but that's not a, a core space. So you're getting onto something after it's moved through. Do you do that via IPO? Uh, probably not, because we've seen some absolute doozies. Uh, we were probably the best example uh, in that IPO space, and we've seen some shockers since then too. So you do want to see something listed on the board that's starting to grind along. But if you believe in the message, and this is what it always comes back to, Mitch, if you believe in the message and it's aligned with what your personal beliefs are and what your values are, hook the trailer up to it and move along with it. I missed out on making a lot of money out of Afterpay because it was in, it got to a point where I thought it was overcooked and it largely wasn't consistent with my values uh, in terms of you know, the, the, the possibly unconscionable practice of uh, you know, that uh, uh, buy now, pay later space. So it didn't sit alongside my values. Commercially, I wish I'd stayed in it. But I opted out for a couple of reasons, valuation. And secondly, you, know, you look at it and you start to see the sort of bad debt increments that people are uh, building up on it. You go, yeah, that's probably not, not quite the, the company I may have thought it was and put it to the side. And it's cost me an awful lot of money by doing that. Um, other times I've been in stocks that have been uh, at the vanguard of stuff and they've done very well. I've traded Netflix plenty of times and made a lot of money out of that because it continues to grow. Disney as it's moved from being traditional Disney movies, theme parks to... Uh, being a streamer in technology, I've made a great deal of money out of that. So things change. And so you've got to align your view uh, with what your investment decisions are. And if you're happy to take on board that spice, that volatility uh, in those more aggressive type, highly valued stocks, um, then pin your ears back and get stuck in and, and, and make a mozza out of it. And if that's not your style of investing, then don't. And it's no different to really choosing music to listen to. You know, you might want to listen to some Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra or some easy going, you know, cruisy music going. You might want thrash metal. You might want balearic trance, hardcore rave music. Everyone's got a different taste. It's all music, just like they're all stocks, but they all behave or, or they, they're, they're all very different to the palate. And so too is uh, trading and investing. And of course, the methodologies to make your decisions. 
Valuation is a terrific way of doing it. It served Warren Buffett incredibly well as it has millions of people around the world. Is it appropriate in today's technology-driven world? Maybe it needs a revision. But then again, that might not be the space that you want to work in in any case. So stick to the knitting and stick what you enjoy and stick what you put in. Great way to finish, AB. Thank you very much for your advice. Most appreciated. Anytime, Mitch. Thanks very much. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button, and we'll see you next week.